Hey, everybody. This is Brian Keenan from the Bayshore Center at Bivalve, bringing you another Interviews from the Mirwald. And I'm really excited today to have a friend of the Bayshore Center, um, an important friend of the Bayshore Center, Connie McCart, who's been a volunteer and an educator with us um, past and present. Connie has a, um, a pretty impressive career in academia, both um, with herself and her um, uh, many degrees and in educating children. And she's also uh, quite familiar with our South Jersey history and volunteers, whether that's good or bad, I don't know, Connie, um, with uh, other historical societies and organizations to promote our local history. And Connie, thank you so much for joining us on an episode of Interviews from Mirwald. Glad to be here, Brian. Well, Connie, you have um, generously volunteered. Um, I think you were volunteered. Maybe you were forced into doing no, this. No, no, no. <laughs> to writing what we think is a really interesting book, but you know, maybe we're unique. You are writing a book uh, about the A.J. Mirwald, which is New Jersey's um, state tall ship and a 92-year-old oyster schooner from the Delaware Bay, our pride and joy here. What? made you want to write a book about the A.J. Mirwald? Well, you know, it was funny. I was um, vacationing in, um, off Cape May Point with a friend, and um, the Mirwald was doing public sales out of uh, Cape May. And we decided to take a morning and take a ride on her. And I just loved it, just loved it. And um, the captain said, you know, we have a lot of people who volunteer to come help fix the boat. But what we need are educators. We really need educators, onboard educators. And I said, oh, I'm a teacher. <laughs> so this was the year before I retired. So as soon as I retired, I came down and took the training in the spring to be an onboard educator. So of course I, I sailed as an educator with the Mirwald for over 11 years and uh, got to know something about her history and um, fell in love with the boat as so many people do. Once you get on her, you just fall in love with her and you really just enjoy that ride so much. And I thought it was a shame that the history that people learn, the limited amount that they learn when they're on board on a public sale uh, didn't go any further. It seemed to me that with all of the materials that I knew that were archived there at Bayshore and all of the materials that had to be out there on its history, um, that it needed a wider audience, that there should be some place that people could go to and just pull something off the shelf and, and learn all about her, not just those who've been on board, but anybody who happened to be browsing through a gift shop or whatever. So I thought, well, hey, I'd like to do a book on that. And what, you know, what makes her so unique or so interesting of a story? What did you learn? Or, you know, what would our audience learn from the book that you're currently writing about her? Well, that, that's so, like so many of the old wood boats, she uh, wound up a derelict and um, what they call, which I've learned they call, was uh, up on the bank meaning that they just let her slide up onto the mud bank at the edge of a river or bay and, and the boats would deteriorate. And of course, if you take the Morris River north of, north, I don't know, but yes, upstream north, yep. from, from, um, from Bayshore Project Piers, you, you see several of them out there. And um, it just, it just that she is now up there. And, and I learned, from um, sailing on her also that she's one of the few tall ships that is restored and actually the original boat. Most of the replicas like the Pride of Baltimore too, <laughs> several replications yes. there. And they, there are only, I think three, if I recall correctly, that are actually original schooners. And so here is this fantastic boat and she certainly looks fantastic as she goes sailing by I mean people just guess she's so beautiful and um, it, you know that was a, a special kind of a thing that they were able 
to put her back together and to build such a following for her. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree, you know, as the new director here to think about what it was like when the organization got started and literally, you know, feet on the ground, restoring the boat as a real community effort. Uh, and she is the pride and joy of South Jersey, Jersey of Cumberland County. But I was really surprised to know that people as far away as Maine know her and know her well because of, as you said, she's one of the last of the original restored boats and not a replica. Um, right. And in fact, um, in, a, in another series on interviews <coughs> on the Mirrorwald, with interviews on the Mirrorwald, we're interviewing the shipwrights that are gonna restore her the second time uh, this coming September. And to see their level of excitement, these young guys, right. to show up and see the boat and you know, oh my gosh, she's original, it's wood, it's, you know, this is, you know, look at the carpentry and the type of, you know, um, it's, you know, I got excited because they were so excited. Um, and for people in New Jersey, I think, you know, we're sandwiched between New York and Philadelphia and we don't have our own sports teams. We don't have, you know, we're, our identity is kind of hard to figure out. So to have this one thing, the AJ Muir wall, that's the state's tall ship, that really is unique nationwide um, is pretty exciting to me. Um, and her history is kind of muddied. Um, and what I was excited about you writing the book for us is it, it brings more clarity to a story that, you know, sometimes people in the tall ship industry like to tell tall tales, like fishermen. <laughs> and those tall <laughs> tales can become facts <laughs> when they're not. Yeah. Um, and just to find out who the boat was actually named for uh, and that we were thinking it was named for somebody else when really it was, you know, a different generation of person right. is, is right. not insignificant. Right, it was, a, it was a, a, a lot of research that we did and Rachel kept turning over more and more information. Uh, she would say, I, I guess I'm overloading you and <laughs> she almost was, you know, we just had um, piles of stuff to wade through to try and um, make sure that we were on target and not wandering off too much um, to either side because there are so many stories to be told in the area. But, um, but I, I think we were able to put something together that is uh, to the point and yet elaborate enough to enjoy. So what, how did it all get started? I mean, there's the Mirwald family, right? How did they get started in, uh, the industry? What will the readers find out in that first few pages? Well, the, the captain at the original Augustus Mirwell, the one who the ship was named for, he did not sail that boat, but he came to the area down around Dan Dennis Township and he did have, uh, he was an oysterman. He was out there, not on the A.J. Mirwell, that came later, but uh, Mirwell Sr., had um, two, two, three, I'm trying to remember now, it's either two or three boats of his own, um, a slip, a bug eye, and I think eventually a schooner that he used in the oyster industry. And then when um, he really injured himself, he was not able to keep on going with it, but his sons, Gus, who is Augustus J. Jr., and one of his brothers, Bill, were the ones who had the Mirwold um, commissioned from Dorchester and at the Dorchester shipyard and named it after their father. And apparently the practice is in the oyster industry to name the ships after your mom, your sister, your father, you know, most of the boats, and, and, and you've heard that I'm sure, or you can see it as you go out along the bay that most of the boats are named after people. Yes, the the women particularly. They, yeah. yeah, they're all, all named after someone, yeah. They're finicky like a, like a wife might be. Or, <laughs> um, yeah, the, and um, the AJ actually had two different names because then when she was purchased by the Phillips family, Mrs. Phillips renamed her the Clyde A. Phillips and she um, was Clyde A. Phillips at, for some years 
before she was renamed back to the Mirwald. Yeah, she spent most of her. It's been an interesting history to find out that she was really the Clyde A. Phillips for longer than she was the A.J. Mirwald, and yeah. that the boat spent, I think, more time. Did I hear this right? Clamming, clamming, clamming than she did oystering. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. The first, um, the first time that she was out oystering was early on, was only for about five years, and then Phillips did oyster her. Phillips Senior did have her out oystering for a while, but then not for too long, a few years, maybe another five, and um, the oyster industry collapsed. And so she was refitted um, to go clamming, which of course was uh, not good for her to say the least, because no. clamming is a whole other kind of rigging and um, a lot more weight on the boat. And it was a disaster so far as her physical health, if you will, is concerned. And then she was taken off during World War II to uh, Philadelphia. Oh yeah, in the middle there, she was a fire boat. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the um, Mirwald family did not do well. They had, during the depression, and they had uh, difficulties monetarily. So what they did was, uh, during the war, the small boats, uh, commission, I think it is, of the United States Coast Guard was commandeering boats to be used in the war effort. Um, so they took the Mirwald and took her up to uh, the Philadelphia Camden Harbor and refitted her with um, pumps of, for, for pumping water and the like and took off her masts and the like and made her into a fire boat. And so she spent the war years going back and forth between Camden and Philadelphia where they were unloading munitions. And of course that's a very dangerous kind of a uh, cargo and easily could lead to fires. And so that was her chore was to protect. Um, yeah, I didn't understand the connection to a fire boat but it makes sense that the it was the, in the ammunition that they were afraid of. Yeah, exploding uh, catching fire. I did right. read someplace that um, when the Mirwald family had the boat returned to them, that they were really, it, they were hurt, mm. emotionally hurt to see her poor physical condition yeah. Yeah. upon return. And there, there were a lot of, um, there's a lot of letters back and forth between the Mirwald family and uh, politicians they knew who they called in to help us, a local senator, for instance, going, they were offered very paltry sum, they felt, for her to be returned to them. And um, when she finally, they went back and forth on how much. And I think the, the senator and the others who wrote uh, on their behalf, they had a lawyer involved in the whole process and the like. I think they did have some influence because the Coast Guard managed to come up a little bit so far as the monetary um, amount mm -hmm. was concerned. Um, but then when they went down to pick her up, um, they say uh, he just cried because, I guess it was Gus, he cried because the boat looked so sad. It was just in such poor condition. You know, we really do romanticize um, the you know, seafaring industry in the good old days, but the Mirwald family and the boat really saw some tough times. I mean, the Great Depression, World War II, the collapse of the oyster industry, MSX. Uh, and then by that point, you know, modernization and mechanization of the um, shellfish industry came in and the Mirwald, the boat itself, the AJ Mirwald was no longer, um, you know, a relevant or you know, it was an antique when it came to the oyster industry, which is ironic because even today here at the Bayshore Center, you can see um, boats almost as old as her still mm -hmm. going out every day to oyster. They're not under sail, they're no. under power. Right, um, right. We, we, we talk about that in the book also because there are um, a, a half a dozen, I think, Oh, the oyster schooners, wooden oyster schooners still out there. And, uh, but they, 
you know, unfortunately, again, not under sale. And uh, the one Captain Fenton Anderson explains that and talks about how it really hurts to have to do that, but it has to be done. It has to be done. It has to be done, right. And yeah. that's what makes the work of the Bayshore Center and the um, Bayshore Discovery Project uh, so impressive that they were able to bring the boat back from from the banks, did you say, from the mud? Yeah, from... basically it was sitting in the mud down in Salisbury, Maryland for quite some time. Yeah, it, it had been purchased by um, a, a guy named McDaniel and he didn't want the boat, but oyster boats come with their oyster licenses. And he wanted the oyster licenses, so he purchased the boat for that reason, but then he used them on another boat that he had that was in good condition, a, a power boat, because by then you could use power. When they originally were, uh, when they were in the heyday, as, the, as it were, I hate to keep using that word, but um, at the height of the oyster industry, they were only under sale. It wasn't until after World War II right. that they were allowed to use their engines when they were oyster. So um, he had a boat already under power. So he just ignored the mirror wall left over there. She, well, at the time she was the Phillips, Quade Phillips, and used his oyster, the, her oyster licenses elsewhere. So, you know, but yeah, it was uh, the oyster industry and seamen, watermen um, have always had a very hard life. Um, and I wonder sometimes if that isn't what makes them um, so strong and so determined to stick with what they are doing. Uh, we look back, as you said, with nostalgia on the good old days, but the good old days uh, were not ones where we had uh, the luxuries we take for granted now, like for instance, mm -hmm. computers and, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, several automobiles in every family and a couple of TV, you know, we didn't have those things. People, people didn't and they managed quite well without them, I must say. But they um, worked hard, and I think you had probably more satisfaction, and that's probably true of the waterman today. When he gets done, he has a great deal of satisfaction with what he's achieved for the day. You know, he comes out, he knows what he wants to do, and he gets it done, and he goes home successful, or hopefully successful. Um, I, I, it's a sidebar, I guess, but my husband was a carpenter. And we would ride around South Jersey and he would say, oh, I built that. And I did a major renovation yeah, yeah. there. And I thought how fortunate he was that he had a tangible thing there to prove his skills and that he had been successful in what he was doing. You know, and it's amazing to me. Sort of not like that. You know? the, the industry today, it might be more mechanized, but it's still hard work. girls wandering down to the docks early, 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 early in the morning here in Bivalve mm -hmm. um, to get on those oyster boats uh, in the cold, going out in the heat mm -hmm. in the summer. Um, their hands are like meat cleavers. Their shoulders are like linebackers from hauling those nets overboard and, you know, and bringing the oysters, the dredges on board for, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's still a tough business and you're still dependent on the weather, you know, whether there's too much fresh water into the bay can cause the spat to die and you don't, you won't have oysters for the next season. It, I think we forget, you know, when we buy so many packaged goods in the supermarket that we're still so dependent on the boats and the weather. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not a bygone era. I mean, it's still, you know, New Jersey is still the second or third largest oyster producer in the country and Cape May is the second largest uh, seaport on the East Coast. And for those of us who are just vacationing on the beach there, we don't necessarily see that or appreciate that New Jersey is still that connected to its um, seafaring businesses. When I mentioned to people that, cause I have, I have toured that sort of that area down in Cape May when I mentioned, oh, you know, we, we still have, we have scallop boats out there too, you know, and, and people that we, we have scallop, yes. <laughs> yes, and Jersey does all that sort and, of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's not just the lobster house, right? You know, we don't catch lobsters here. Um, it's those other businesses. Um, and the mere wall, you know, and the story that you're telling, I think really is important for our own ego here in the state um, and for our heritage. It's not just 
important for history's sake, but it's also important, I think, for the future of pe people to know that this business does exist, that not every kid is meant to go to college or will enjoy college, that there's businesses still in effect where you can work on a boat or literally work to fix a boat, which is what we talk about with our uh, shipwrights in another series. Or you can author a book about a boat. Um, it's still a really big business. What excited you the most? What was the most aha moment, the biggest thing you learned from the book? Uh, I don't know that it's the biggest thing I learned from the book, but the most interesting thing I learned from the book was the, um, from, from putting together the book, was the fact that Ron Howard and his group had done a film in Shell Pile. They, uh, were up this way, they were doing a, a thing on migrant workers and they needed a setting that was run down and terrible and bespoke uh, the conditions for migrant workers in an earlier era. And there was Shell Pile, which up until the, into the 1970s, people were still living there without indoor plumbing, without heat in their homes, and without any real sanitation in the area, which it's hard to believe that that existed in New Jersey that late into the 20th century, but it did. And so they were able to film there was uh, Cloris Leachman and uh, Ron Howard and Sissy Spacek was in the film too. And apparently they were very, very gracious, they stayed in the little trailer and they wrote out um, autographs for people like crazy. But um, I thought that was, that was very interesting and surprising piece of information that we learned. You know, that, just, those that's new information to me. Hmm? Um, yeah, that's, it sounds like there's another book in your future there, Connie. Because <laughs> um, it is one of those interesting places about New Jersey. I think the thing that I found most interesting was, um, uh, well, was one that the, I think the, the human side of the boat and the story, and I, I was more interested in hearing from you and our curator, Rachel Dohansik, about the human experience of the boat and the Mirwald family and the hard times that a family has, uh, you know, through its lifetime and you know, living through the Great Depression and going from the oyster boat, which, you know, it wasn't that they just commissioned the oyster boat and then the Great Depression came and the war came. They had mortgaged their home to build the to build the yeah. mirror wall. They lost their mm -hmm. home. Um, and then as industrious as people are, they took up chicken farming um, as a way to sustain itself. And um, there are mirror walls still here in South Jersey, a few here and there. And um, that they're buried right here over at St. Elizabeth of Hungary in the in the Catholic cemetery. And, and um, have a street named after them. A street Mirror named after them. <laughs> and uh, I, I loved that one of the family members couldn't believe that we were trying to save the boat, that they had just, in their mind, the boat was just such a headache. It was a workhorse, it was dirty. Why would anyone wanna you know save this? And then another family member just, in shock that their family boat has become the state tall ship uh, for New Jersey. So when you see the pictures of the Mirwald shortly before they began renovating her of the Clyde Phillips at that time, um, you can imagine why they would think that because it is a terrible looking sight. And you yeah. had to have, um, you had to have an appreciative eye for a schooner to um, imagine what she would look like once restored. Yeah, and the, I was speaking with John Gandy, who owned the boat briefly from its time from Maryland until it was brought back to New Jersey. And he said that when the boat was being towed into the Morris River, how it looked like a fire ship. Because, yeah. you know, it there was so, so many, many holes in it. <laughs> so many holes in it and so many pumps and the you know, water coming water off was the just boat. Spraying everywhere. It's spraying yeah. everywhere uh, yeah. to keep her from, from sinking again. And that the community. I don't know if it would happen today. I don't know if my generation or the generation after me would have the same gumption and excitement to pull together to restore and save some, some bit of history. You may have a point in that 
I think some of the original guys who began working on the ship and putting in those hours were folks who still could remember the sailing ships out there when they were young. Mm -hmm. And so that probably helped spur their interest. And so that might be, um, might be a, a difference that would occur today that people would not have built in yeah. memories that they could go back and say, I remember, you know, and we were, uh, you, the oral histories that you've done down there at Bayshore, to, uh, there are a number of people who would remember seeing them. And I would watch for my father's boat, you know, and um, watching them all go out in the morning. And if it hadn't been that we still had some of those old folks around who remembered what those ships looked like, then there may not have been as much interest in doing the volunteer work that brought her around. I love the stories about today from people about how the mirror wall touched them um, when they were young. So we got to speak with a, a scientist over at Haskin Labs next door, which is part of Rutgers. And um, she had always been uh, interested in marine science, but you know, being on the mirror world was part of that experience that inspired her career to be a marine biologist. Oh, that's um, great. And then I love uh, this, uh, not this summer, but the summer before there was a field trip here and uh, from some local school. And one of the fathers said, hey, hey, I came here to this boat when I was in the fourth grade. And it was only that he, you know, it, until he arrived, he remembered that he mm -hmm. had been on that boat. And we have we have people who have regular family reunions on the Mirwald. They oh, said that's it's perfect. Great. It's two hours, <laughs> just long enough to get to know each other, but you, you don't fight with each other. Um, <laughs> and then one of my favorite stories was by a woman who it was the anniversary. Uh, it was Father's Day, the year after her husband died. And she had young kids and she didn't know what she was going to do on Father's Day. And she decided that she, at the last minute, bought some tickets on the mirror wall as a way to distract her and the children from Father's Day. And how it turned out to be one of the best memories she's had with her children. That day, the day that she was dreading, turned out to be a day where she has some of the best memories. And how hearing the, the crew call their commands back and forth to each other was sort of meditative um, and the quiet and the sails and how she felt connected to something greater than herself for just this brief moment in time. And I've heard that more often than not. One person told me that they had lived in Atlantic Highlands their whole life and had never been on the Raritan Bay because there's no opportunity to sail on the Raritan Bay unless you own a boat. Uh, right. So mm. the Mirwald gives people the ability to experience the state in a way they otherwise would not from the water and we're a peninsula so and most people don't own a boat absolutely and and the children that we bring on board the school children because of course most of the sailing i did on the boat was um school groups student groups that were um brought aboard and um you know you 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 have no discipline problems on board the Mirwald. The kids are so thrilled to be there yeah. that no matter what group, teenagers, I mean, even teenagers were not bored on, on board the boat. They were still, you know, some were um, nervous because will I fall overboard, you know, or something. And um, they, but they're so fascinated by the ship. And that one day, uh, three hours for the for the educational sales, that one day on board that ship, they learn so much more than they would in those three hours sitting in a classroom, which is true of many field trips. Yeah. But, you know, in, in this case, one of the things that we're doing both in this for the students and for the adults who come on board for the public sales is we're, we're showing them the Western seaboard of New Jersey. Everybody knows the Eastern seaboard. Yeah. Everyone knows about, you know, the, the Atlantic seashore, um, but not so many people are that familiar 
with the very unique um, uh, topography, topography and, and, yep. and, and a atmosphere of the Western seaboard. It's totally different from the East. Well, I'm, I was one of those people and I have told this story numerous times where uh, I live in North Jersey and I, well, we call it Central Jersey. You guys call it North Jersey. Um, and I, <laughs> I, I have the great fortune of living in this beautiful rural spot part of every week. And when I go home, people think I work in Delaware because I say the boat sails on the Delaware Bay. And finally, you know, in frustration, I said to one of a friend of mine who's an attorney, well-educated, and he kept saying, you work in Delaware. I said, no, I work in New Jersey on the Delaware Bay. And he looked at me perplexed. And I said, yeah, the Delaware Bay. I said, what do you think is on the other side of Cape May? And he said, the parkway. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, beyond the parkway. And he didn't know there was a beyond the parkway. And so can you imagine if people got off the parkway and made a right instead of a left? Yeah. You would experience a whole different part of New Jersey that, you know, part of me doesn't want them to come because you don't want it disturbed. It's so beautiful. But the cranberry yeah. bog, the blueberries, um, the yeah. lima beans, the, the A.J. Meerwald, um, there's a lot to explore. Yeah. And the wetlands, the marshes themselves are beautiful the in, marshes. Their, in their own right, you know, and of course, so totally necessary to the health of our state. And we get to see the most beautiful sunsets here. Oh, God, yes. Yes, I mean, beautiful, no and I think in the winter, they're even more beautiful. In the crisp, cold, you know, evening oh. air when the sun is setting um, makes them the most beautiful. Uh, well, they're most beautiful, I think, Brian, when you're standing on deck. Yeah. When you're yeah. standing watch and the sun comes down, I mean, that's, that's a beautiful experience. Well, Connie, I can't thank you enough for taking the time, not just to speak with us today, but you have been volunteering for a year to write this book. Uh, in addition to your 11 years of volunteering as a shipboard educator, um, you've really spent um, the good part of this pandemic uh, and being cooped up, being productive at least. Yes, it's kept me busy. <laughs> um, and just think of how many more people you're going to educate. Um, how many people are going to have an experience? Maybe they can't make it to bivalve. Um, or to your point, think about the people who can no longer sail or just no longer have the opportunity, but they'll be able to experience some portion of it again through your book. Well, it certainly has been a lot of fun to do it. I can say that. I mean, now we're down to the nitty gritty. We're up to do the <laughs> the captions and, the, and, and the, the citations, which is not much fun, but, you know, it's just been a, a real pleasure to, to, to spend the time on the research and working with Rachel is wonderful, of course, and um, I, I really am, am glad that I had the opportunity to do it. When do you hope the book will be out for people to purchase? Well, our deadline is in March, and I believe that... Um, the History Press intends to have it available by late fall, maybe October, November of this year. So that would be just in time for people to be buying Christmas gifts for the uncle you don't know what to get uh, and the like. So, you know, hopefully that will give us a, a good, ready, immediate market. And that will, the sale of the book... Um... You could, you'll be able to buy it through the Bayshore Center at Bivalve's website at our gift shop here at the Bayshore Center. Um, and the proceeds of that boat are going towards the ship's second restoration. Right. So the boat has been for 25 years out sailing. Nearly 100,000 people have boarded her decks. Um, while the boat has been well cared for, she um, you know, needs yeah. a little sprucing up. Um, and so the million dollar restoration is gonna be in part supported by your efforts. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I would certainly hate to see her not be out there sailing. Yeah, well, she sailed this year, even in the middle of the pandemic, and we had our best sailing season. We had more people to the Bayshore Center than ever before. Really? Um, and that really excited us. And, you know, it was a unique opportunity. People couldn't get out. They couldn't go places. And we were built for remote social distancing. So people came here and it, it worked out. And so right. hopefully they keep coming. So, yeah. Well, Connie, I can't wait to see you in person. I can't wait for you to come and do a book signing here. 
um, maybe in June. Um, but uh, we'll have you here sooner rather than later. So thank you again, okay. Connie. Um, okay. And for uh, we will it, we will share Connie's information. For anyone who wants more information on the Mirwald, we will help them to. Uh, you can reach out to our curator here, um, who will connect you with Connie as needed. So, thank you again, okay. and we'll be talking soon. Thank you, Connie. And you too, Brian. Good to see you. Take care. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.